Well, good morning, everyone. Come on in, have a seat, and uh, relax and enjoy a worship service together with us this morning. God bless you. Good to see you here. Good for us to be able to to be out in the frost and and worshiping God together today. What an opportunity the Lord has given us to be in His house of worship. I want to share with you some prayer needs and uh, and uh, a scripture, and then we will pray and begin our worship service. I ran across a scripture from Psalm 98. This. This is a description of what we're going to do this morning. Listen to Psalm 98, 4. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth with joyous song and sing praises. Now, some of you are going to say, I'm just not that good a musician or singer. But the Lord didn't say sing perfectly. The Lord said make a joyful noise. So do your best. Make a joyful noise. Enjoy worshiping. And... Uh, and uh, let, let's begin with the prayer needs. Uh, I have uh, on the table out here, I don't have it, but it's been placed on the table out here, a list of prayer needs. And uh, there are so many on there that have cancer. And, and uh, I see Eva Howard has returned home from her injury, and we want to continue to pray for her. And uh, I've got, I guess, half a dozen on this list that I've noted who are struggling with cancers and and it's just a a tough thing we need to pray for these people i know uh, uh linda wright kim's sister kim emory's sister and uh, their neighbor edie both have breast cancer we need to keep them in our prayers and uh, so many others on here as well as people who are suffering from uh, the hurricanes and the floods that have gone through we need to pray for folks around the world, not just Christian people, because God created us all, and He loves us all. It's just that some of His children, some of us creations of God, are disobedient to Him. And we need to pray for them that uh, not only that they are healthy and they have life and that they're able to uh, get over these injuries, but also that they would hear the Gospel and respond to the Gospel. Let me share one other need here that Lynn Hill <clears throat> was sharing with me earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Bridget and Josh Buckner, uh, we need to keep them in our prayers. Their, their little boy Colton, four years old, has passed away Thursday afternoon of this week. He's been sick and uh, uh, he's, he's been in prayers, but uh, just just a terrible, terrible thing. We need to pray for them that they can that they can endure for comfort and strength. I don't know if you ever get over this kind of thing, but we have to go on. And we need to hold each other up and encourage each other and, and, and be with each other in the Lord. And so we do that through prayers. We do that through cards and letters. We do that through talking to people and being there with them. So, uh, so let's go to God in prayer right now. And uh, we'll lift all this up to the Lord. Let's, let's pray. Father, you're so good to us, but we know that this world is a desperately evil world. Uh, Father, for a world that would uh, have diseases so, so heinous, so terrible, that a little four-year-old would die. For those who are suffering from cancer, uh, because for many of them, no fault of their own. It's just, Father, these cancers come upon us. For others who are recovering, and uh, in therapy from injuries that they've had. Others, Father, who are depressed and discouraged and uh, who need to be in your house of worship to get courage and to get strength from your word, from the fellowship we have, just to be in, just to be in among God's people. Father, may we encourage each other this morning. May we lift up each other to the Lord. We do pray for, for little Colton's family for uh, Bridget and uh, Josh Buckner and uh, the loss that they have and how they will deal with that. We do pray for families who are struggling with, with uh, cancers and, and serious illness. Father, you know where the needs are and you look in the hearts that we can't see. So we lift them up to you now, Father, and we ask that you'd bless us 
as we worship together, as we lift up Jesus in what we say and do. Father, may this be your service this morning. Be with our praise team, these singers and musicians who work to, to bring us right to the throne of grace in a time of worship. Father, be with every aspect of our service this morning and be with our preacher that he'll be led by your spirit and that he'll, his words will be encouragement to us to serve you and to follow in your footsteps. And now, Father, I do pray that you'd bless us this morning. Bless us as we worship you and just give us all the grace and strength in the world that we might put our faith and trust in you, that we might encourage each other, that we might grow closer. Now bless us in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm reading from Luke's Gospel. This is the, this is the communion uh, institution. This is when Jesus instituted what we call the Lord's Supper. And Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the... Uh, is poured out for me for this cup is poured out for you it's the new covenant uh, in my blood and then a few verses later now there was the 11 apostles judas had already left the gathering the 11 apostles are meeting with jesus but jesus has a farewell and peter is going to do something unusual uh, He's going to say that he will never leave the Lord. He will, he will stand with him. He'll not deny him. In fact, Peter's going to say, uh, I'll die for you. Jesus said in uh, Luke 22, verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you have denied me three times. Well, the sound of a rooster crowing probably sent shivers down Peter's spine for the rest of his life because he did deny that he even knew the Lord. And on that fateful night in, in the temple court after his third denial, no, I don't know the man, no, no, that familiar sound of the rooster suddenly became terrifying. Just as predicted, Peter had denied Jesus three times and now the rooster was blaring an alarm that signaled what Peter had done. No one else knew there in that courtyard, eh, except maybe John, who was there, one of the disciples, but Peter knew. The disciple likely carried the guilt and shame with him forever of what he had done. But what if Peter had chosen a different response? What if instead of feeling guilt every time a rooster would crow, what if Peter chose to be reminded, I messed up, but I am forgiven? I'd like to think that he maybe did do that. The message of Jesus isn't one of condemnation. The message of Jesus is of forgiveness. Now today, as we take the bread and the cup and as we're reminded of his body on the cross and we're reminded of his blood poured out for us, Let's not wallow in guilt or remorse for our failures. Instead, let this be a time of thankfulness that we have been forgiven. Let's pray and then we'll partake together. Father, thank you that we can learn from Peter and that we can do what you would have us to do, Father. May we realize the forgiveness we have as your children and may we serve you bless this time of communion now as we commune together with each other and with and with your son jesus who has died for us and shed his blood that we might live bless us now 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's partake of the bread and then the cup together. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Uh, first thing, I just want to thank everyone uh, for, uh, or thank the church uh, for allowing me to take a week of vacation this past week. Uh, hopefully, uh, those of you who were here last week were blessed by uh, Brett Siebold, uh, who uh, came in to talk a little apologetics, a little, uh, I think it was on uh, some academic stuff, right? Uh, it was on... <laughs> Uh, things are above my pay grade, uh, but uh, he's a very smart guy. Hopefully, you were uh, addressed or blessed by his uh, his uh, word that he gave. Um, also, uh, if you haven't, uh, if I haven't had the opportunity to meet you yet, my name is Evan. I'm the senior minister here, uh, so I'd love to meet you at the end of service. Uh, let's pray, and uh, we'll get started here this morning. Uh, God, thank you so much for uh, this opportunity we have. Uh, to learn some ancient financial wisdom. Uh, You um, are the creator of all things, and you have given us uh, so many resources. Uh, I pray that you would help us to use them the way that you designed them to be used, the way that uh, your will is that we would use them. And I pray that uh, we would be able to grow and expand your kingdom uh, through using them, that we would be able to uh, help people uh, to seek and define you uh, through the, the resources that you've given us. I pray that, uh, that we could use the blessings that you've given us to bless others. And I pray that these financial, um, this financial advice that you've put in your word uh, helps us to be better stewards of, of those resources that you've given us. Help us be wise with our money uh, so that we can faithfully follow and serve you. Uh, Thank you so much for all the rich blessings that you have given us in our life and the greatest blessing of all, salvation through your Son. It's in your name I pray. Amen. Uh, Roman Bloom, who was a quiet man, he mostly kept to himself. His wife died years prior, and they had no children together. He was originally born in Poland, uh, where he survived the Holocaust. Uh, but after World War II, he, he immigrated to the United States and settled down on Staten Island. He, he went into real estate development, and he was able to amass a $40 million net worth in real estate assets. In 2012, he died with no will and no living heirs. Uh, When news of this massive estate being left intestate with no will, no heirs, people began coming out of the woodwork to claim this inheritance. Uh, But nobody was able to verify their kinship to Mr. Bloom. So the entire $40 million estate was left to the state of New York. Uh, They sold off the properties of which an an eight-acre portion uh, was developed into a sprawling shopping center named Roman Plaza after the former owner. Mr. Bloom, he lived his entire life. He gained enormous wealth only for it to go into the coffers of the government. This same state government that is currently in the midst of drastic financial trouble. Uh, Wherever you stand on the the political spectrum, I don't think it's too much to suggest that Mr. Bloom's estate was squandered when it fell into the hands of the government of New York. Proverbs 13, 22 uh, says this, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the sinner's wealth is laid up for the righteous. There are people who who make the claim that money is evil. Or that people who have money are evil. Neither claim is true. Money is not evil, nor is it good. Money is an inanimate object. It's neither evil nor good. Uh, take uh, just like a ba- baseball bat, for instance. A, a baseball bat 
could be used for good or it could be used for evil. Some of you follow me on social media and you already know what I'm going to say. So, uh, but it's neutral. It's neither good nor bad. You can use a baseball bat for having fun, playing the game of baseball, or you can use it for evil. Some people might use it for evil to break a store window, to rob the place. Uh, One of my sons uses a baseball bat for good when he has fun playing the game of baseball. He just had a game yesterday. He had a lot of fun. My other son, he's three, and he used a baseball bat recently for evil. He, uh, his, his brother was watching a show, and it was taking too long for his turn to come to watch a show, and so he just decided to hit the TV with a baseball bat. Uh, he did not realize it was going to shatter the screen, though, uh, but uh, that is exactly what happened. That's what happened uh, this week, so, you know. You think, oh man, he must have had a great week on vacation. Well, that's, that's what happened to me on my vacation. Anyway, uh, but, but just like any other inanimate object, you can use money for good or you can use money for evil. You can use money to purchase ingredients to bake a cake for your neighbor. Or you can use it to purchase 10 rounds of beer at the bar to get drunk. This, this proverb... Proverbs 13, 22 states the truth, that the truth is that using money for good will result in you amassing wealth to leave as an inheritance to your children's children, but using money for evil will only result in your money finding its way to someone who will use the money for good. Using the money for evil purposes will result in the money being squandered. And for people who use ancient financial wisdom, their money turns into wealth. Money has been around for a long time. And the same principles that led to people becoming wealthy long ago are the very same principles that will lead to people becoming wealthy today. There is ancient financial wisdom that can help you handle money better. Have margin in your budget, reduce money fights and money problems in your home, and give you peace when it comes to your finances. And that ancient financial wisdom is found in the Bible. Over the next few weeks, we are going to uh, talk, be, we're going to be talking about that ancient financial wisdom. That ancient financial wisdom that will cause you to be blessed. Uh, for some of you uh, who do not uh, use social media, there is a, a, there's something that kids today call a hashtag. Uh, we used to just call it a pound sign, but today they call it a hashtag. Uh, when you, if you use a hashtag on social media, if you don't use social media, uh, it serves as a tag to form a category. Uh, that's the purpose of a hashtag. Uh, if you type in a certain hashtag, it will bring up all the posts that have used this specific hashtag. Uh, there are many people who post on social media using the hashtag blessed. Uh, so that is what the idea behind this sermon series, hashtag blessed. Uh, if you type in this hashtag, it will bring up all the different posts where people are posting about how blessed they are right? So someone might post a picture of themselves sitting on the beach and in the caption say, hashtag blessed. Uh, Someone might post about getting a new job or buying a new car and add the hashtag blessed. So that's where this sermon series comes from. It's this idea that if we follow this ancient financial wisdom, we will be blessed. It's the idea that, that it, there are some blessings that come from being wise. But there are also some blessings that come to us by, through no feet of our own. They are given to us. Being born in the United States, for instance, is a blessing. It is the richest and most free country in the world. There are more opportunities in this country to move up the socioeconomic ladder than in any other country in the world. Now, the fact that you were born in the 20th century makes you vastly more richer in many ways than all people throughout history. 
We have access to more knowledge, more technology, more conveniences than any people in the history of the world. If you were born in this country at this particular time in history, you won the lottery. Congratulations. The poorest people in the United States are still the top 70 percentile richest people in the world. The family you were born into, the natural talents and skills you were born with, your IQ, were all things that are, were given to you outside of your own control. And so all of us are born with varying degrees of blessings. And these blessings are things that God has determined for you to have. He gave them to you for a purpose. These these blessings are given to you because God determined for you to have them. At Acts 17.26, Paul said these words, And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods, and the boundaries of their dwelling place. That they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward Him and find Him. God has placed you exactly where you are on earth and within this exact place along the timeline of history for the express purpose of giving you an opportunity to seek Him and find him. And to help others seek him and find him also. He gave you the blessings you have so that you could use them to help people seek and find God. He gave you the blessings you have to lead other people to God. The blessings you have been given were given to you for that specific purpose. So that you can find God and you can help other people find God also. And so as Christians, we should be very interested in amassing wealth. Not because we want to have more than someone else. Not because we want to die with the most stuff. That isn't the reason we should be very interested in amassing wealth. We should be very interested in amassing wealth because when wealth is in the hands of a Christian, it will be used for that specific purpose. If you are a person desiring to do the will of God, and God's will for you is to use your money to help people find Christ, We should be trying to get as much money as we can get, as much resources as we can get, so that we can use it for God's will to help other people seek and find God. This is what it means to use your wealth for good. If you use your wealth for the purpose of leading people to Christ, you will be blessed. We are not blessed simply because we have more wealth than someone else. We will be blessed if we use it for God's will, for God's purpose. If you are using your wealth for any other purpose other than to help yourself find God, to help other people find God, you are using your wealth for evil and you will not be blessed. Being blessed goes far beyond just simply amassing more and more wealth. Although that is certainly involved in in the blessing, there is a promise in the Bible that if you are faithful with what you have been given, you will be given more. Uh, Jesus said this at Matthew 25, 23. You have been, you who have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. This principle goes far beyond money. Money is included in the promise. If you 
faithfully use your money and your resources in the way God intends for you to use them, you will be given more. If you are faithful in handling money, you will be given more money. But if you are faithful in the other things that you have been given, your talents and your skills, your IQ, if you are faithful using them for God's intended purpose, you will be blessed with more. This isn't the health and wealth gospel, okay? This isn't the prosperity gospel. The the prosperity gospel says that if you have enough faith, if you pray certain prayers, if you are obedient enough to God, He will bless you with health and wealth. That That isn't what the Bible is saying. The prosperity gospel says if you are not healthy, if you are not wealthy, it's, it's evidence of some type of sin in your life. That isn't what the Bible says. That isn't this principle. This, this principle, this promise, is simply cause and effect. If you are obedient to God's commands found in the Bible, you, your life will be more blessed because of it. If you follow the command not to steal, for instance, you won't have to worry about getting arrested, getting put in jail. However, if you disobey that command, you will most likely be arrested and thrown in jail. At the very least, you'll be looking over your shoulder for the rest of your life, right? You will be blessed if you obey, not blessed if you don't. And so when when we apply this principle to money, we find that if we obey God's instructions on how to handle money, we will be blessed with more money. But that requires us to use the money in the way God intends for us to use it, to help people seek and find God. If we use our money for good, For helping other people seek and find God, he will bless us with more money so that we can use it to help more people seek and find God. So over the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at these ancient financial, this ancient financial wisdom that's found in the Bible. What does the Bible tell us to do specifically with our money? What specifically are we to do to help people seek and find God? What are God's instructions for handling money? If you have your Bibles, uh, you can turn to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Uh, Here in 1 Timothy 6, the Apostle Paul laid out God's plan for handling money. And the words will also be on the screen behind me. But in a very succinct way, Paul just lays out God's instructions for using money. What we should do with it. How we should use it. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, be rich in good works, to be generous, to be generous and ready to share. Thus, storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. So that they can seek God and find Him and help others do so as well. The instructions are for the rich in this present age. In Paul's day, when he wrote this, in his present age... There were a select few people who were rich. Very few people were wealthy. Less than 1% of the population had more money than simply a day's wage. Most people lived day to day. They worked a day's labor. They would get paid at the end of the day. They would stop by the market on their way home to buy some bread to take it home to their wife and kids. That was it. Most people lived on about a thousand calories a day. They built their, home, their own homes out of material that they found themselves. They made their own clothes. They made their own pottery. And they lived very simple lives. 
They did not have money to be generous, to give to the poor. They were the poor. But to the rich 1%, who had more money than just a day's wage, Paul gave them these instructions. So if you have more money than just what you can live on for one day, then you are by definition rich in this present age. And so these instructions are for you. The first instruction is to have the right mindset about money. You should not be haughty or arrogant with what you've been given. Because it was given to you by God. If you, you, if you believe that everything you own is yours, you are denying that it was given to you by God. Uh, you've heard people say, I, I work very hard for what I have. And that may be true. But who gave you the talent and the ability that you used to work? It was God. Recognize that everything you have was given to you by God. And so don't be arrogant. Have a humble mindset when it comes to money. This is the first piece of ancient financial wisdom. Be humble about what you have. God gave it to you, and so you should use it the way He wants you to. Now, second, do not rely on money because it is uncertain. You can have it today, and tomorrow it can be gone. Just look at your 401k right now, and then that you can see that's true. It is God who you should rely on because He's the one who provides you with everything. And third, he has, he has given us everything we have for our enjoyment to bless us so that our lives will be blessed. He's given us these blessings because he loves us. He wants us to find joy in life. But he tells us in order to find joy in life, you need to use money the way he instructs. He hasn't given us what he has given us because he wants to curse us. Sometimes money and wealth can be a curse, right? There are people who win the lottery and they, they win hundreds of millions of dollars and it turns out to be the worst thing that has ever happened to them because they end up using it for evil purposes. Nearly 70% of all lottery winners end up filing for bankruptcy within years of winning because they squander it all. Only 55%, a little over half, even say that they're happier after they win than they were before. God blesses us for our enjoyment so that we can find joy in life. But that joy comes through handling our wealth the way he tells us to in his word. There are four ways that Paul lays out here in 1 Timothy, four ways that we can use our money, our resources, to where we will find enjoyment, where we will find joy in the blessings that he's given us. The first is to do good with it. Now, we've already touched on this a little bit. Uh, in, this, in this sermon a little bit. Uh, we, we talked about how a righteous man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. He does this by using his money for good. A man who does good with his wealth will un end up having more and more. Doing good with your wealth means that you invest it into making things better. There are four ways that Paul says that we make things better, things that we can invest our, our money in to make things better. We can invest our money into good things that make our own lives better. Most of the, the good things that we invest our, our money in are things for ourselves, things for our family, and that's okay. It's good to spend money on yourself. It's good to spend money on your own family if you are spending it on things that will make your life better. Uh, hold on to that for a second. I'm going to come back to that. Uh, but 
the, the second thing that Paul says, the, the second instruction that Paul gives on, on what we should use our money for is to be rich in good works. Use your money to invest in the world, to do good things in the world, to invest in society. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more next week. But it's important and good to use your money to contribute to society. Use your money to start a business where, people, where you provide people with things that improve their lives. If you open up a grocery store, for instance, and you sell healthy food at a reasonable price, you will be providing something good for other people. Something that many people need. If you open up an auto repair shop, you can provide people a service they need. Car repair. You can use your money to fund research and development into new technologies or new innovations that can improve people's lives. You can use your money to build your income or to build your business so that you can provide jobs for other people to uh, produce an income for themselves. Good works, being rich in good works, all that means is, is just providing a service. Providing a ministry. A ministry is just something that you do that helps someone else out. A lot of times we, we think in terms of donations or charity. That's actually the next thing that Paul mentions. Paul makes a distinction between good works and generosity. Good works are ways that we serve people by providing them with a need. And we do this every day when we work. Our jobs, our careers, they provide a need for other people. And so when we do this with this mindset that, that we are using what God has given us to help someone else, we are being obedient to God and we, use, we are using our wealth for good. The, the third thing is that we can invest in others. Now, this is the instruction to be generous with our wealth. This is charity. Buy someone food so they have the energy to go out and work and, and, and use what you have given them. Because God blessed you, you can bless them so that they can go out and do good with what, what, what they've been given. Pay someone to go get job training. Pay, someone, pay for someone's college education. Give someone a leg up in some way. Invest in someone else. That is really what charity is, being generous is. It's investing in someone else to help them get to a place where then they can bless others as well. Uh, we'll talk more about that in, in two weeks. Uh, the fourth thing that Paul instructed here was to be ready to share. If you have been given much, be prepared to share it. Be ready to share. This is the instruction to invest in growth. If you spend all your money on yourself, the first thing that he instructs, you won't have any money left over for anything else. If you spend some on yourself and some on a business or, or other ways that you might be investing in society, you won't be able to be generous investing in someone else. If you spend yourself on the first, uh, all your money on the first three things, you won't have any left. If you spend 100% of your money, this is the ancient financial wisdom. That's just really common sense. If you spend 100% of your money, you won't have any left. Okay? So if you spend 100% of your money, you won't be ready to share because you won't have any left. And so it's important to invest in growth. Paul explain, what Paul is explaining here is, or he explains what he means by when he says ready to share, when he says, when he, when he explains it, he says, it's storing up treasure for yourself as a good foundation for the future. This is investing in growth, investing in the future, making sure that you will have money in the future to use for God's specific purposes. This is just financial investing. Set some of it aside for the future so that it will grow, so that you will have more to spend on yourself, more to invest in your work or your career, 
and more to give away to others. In simple terms, uh, the four things you should do with money are spend some on yourself, some on your family, spend some on growing your career, give some of it away, and save some for the future. Doing these four things will result in you being blessed. Doing these four things will result in you enjoying what God has blessed you with. Uh, we're going to talk more in depth about the last three things in the next three weeks. But for the rest of the time that we have here this morning, I want to focus in on that first thing that we were instructed to do with money. Do good with your money. More specifically, spend it on yourself, spend it on your family in such a way that your life is better because of it. That's the important part. There, there are lots of things that, that we can spend our money on that do not make our lives better, right? Now, how many of you go to the store and you buy something, and when you're buying it, you think, oh man, this is, this is going to be great, right? I mean, there's so many ways I can use this, whatever it is. And then you buy it, you have all these intentions for how to use it, you get home, it gets stuffed in a closet, and you never see it again. You don't have to raise your hand, but uh, by the laughing, it tells me you've done that before. Uh, that is not a purchase that improves your life, right? It actually kind of makes your life worse because all it is doing is taking up space for something that actually might be useful, something that might, you might actually use, something that might be actually helpful. Doing good with your money means that you use your money to make your life better. If I had to guess, I would say that probably 80%, maybe even more, of the things that we spend our money on are things for ourselves. Probably 80% of the things we spend money on would fall into this category. Paying your bills, buying groceries, buying clothes, paying your rent, paying for your kids to play sports. All of these things are buying, paying to get a haircut. All these things are things that we pay, pay for and spend money on for ourselves or for our family. The vast majority of the things we spend money on would probably fall into this category. They're for yourselves, for your family. But the key to this piece of financial wisdom is that if you're going to spend money on yourself, if you're going to spend money on your family, be wise about your spending. The best way to be wise with your spending is to create a budget. Uh, when you make a budget, all you do is you just itemize every single thing that you regularly spend money on. If you've never done this before, it can be eye-opening. Uh, you're, you're probably spending money on things that you didn't even realize you were spending money on. But what this does is it allows you to see everything that you spend money on. So that you can see what you probably need to stop spending money on. Are those $7 coffees from Starbucks actually improving your life? Or could you have the same quality of life by making coffee at home? Is your 15 trips to Target every month actually improving your life? Or could you do with five? Now the next thing, after you create this budget and you kind of uh, sift through it, is to evaluate your budget. Do a budget inventory. Go through every single item on your budget and see if you can cut things out of your life. Things that don't really improve your life. Things that don't really make you happy or bring you joy. There are many things that we spend money on that are essential, right? We have to spend money on car insurance. And so when you evaluate your budget and you get to car insurance, you can ask yourself, well, can I get the exact same car insurance at a cheaper price through a different company? Uh, we use an insurance broker. Uh, just the other day, uh, I got an email saying, hey, there's this other insurance company that'll give you the exact same insurance for a cheaper price. Do you want to switch? Yes, I do. Uh, things like getting an insurance broker, things like shopping uh, cell phone providers, Things like that can create margin in your budget. You can get the exact same thing at a cheaper price, or you can completely cut out things from your budget 
that don't actually bring you joy or don't actually make your life better. These are ways that you can do good with your bunny. That you can use it more wisely. Uh, the third thing after you create a budget, after you evaluate your budget, is to assess the value of things in your budget. Prioritize them from most important to least important. And I am pretty sure that whatever is least important, you can pro probably just cut out completely. But assess the value of the things on in your budget. And what that really means is do the things that you're spending your money on improve your life. Uh, another way to ask that is do the things that you're spending your money on improve your health? Do they make you physically more healthy? Evaluate what you're spending money on uh, for groceries or for eating out. Does it make you physically healthy or physically unhealthy? Do you spend money on the gym? And are you actually going to the gym? Does what you spend your money on make you mentally healthy? Does it give you anxiety or does it alleviate your anxiety? Does it make you depressed or does it help bring down your depression? Does it make you spiritually more healthy? Health is what makes you blessed, not wealth. And so if we are going to spend money on ourselves, on our family, we need to be wise about how we spend it. Spend it on things that improve our lives, that make us more healthy, make our families more healthy. Having all the money in the world and being unhealthy is not being blessed. Using your money to improve your health and the health of your family makes you blessed. But blessed does not mean just simply being wealthy. Being healthy is being blessed. And so you know, if we're going to spend money on ourselves, on our family, it needs to be on things that improve our health, that improve our life. If we're going to spend money, in which all of us do, we need to be wise about how we spend it. Over the next three weeks, we're going to talk more about how to use money, how to invest in various things to not only make our lives better, but other people's lives better, but not just simply to improve their lives for the specific purpose of helping them seek and find God. Let's pray. Oh God, uh, we just thank you. We thank you for so many rich blessings that, that we enjoy. And thank you for loving us enough to give them to us. Thank you for uh, the, your love and your uh, compassion for us, that you would uh, so, so richly lavish blessings on us. Help us to use what you have given us to improve our lives, to improve our health, because that is what is, that is what is a blessing. But help us remember there are so many spiritual blessings that you have given us. That you give us joy and you give us peace. You give us hope that far outweighs any physical blessing that we could ever have. The greatest blessing that you could give us is salvation. And if there's anyone here today that is struggling with their finances, that is um, uh, just, it's just weighing on them, I, I pray that you would help them to know that they can have every blessing in the world through your son Jesus. That they can find hope and they can find peace through him. That's in your name I pray. Amen.